Uh, firstly, can I wish my Lords happy Brexit Day? I'm sure, like me, you all have very happy memories of this time five years ago. There's a couple in. Uh, indeed, one of the reasons why so many millions voted to leave the EU, not Europe, inspired by the democratic spirit, was to escape top-down, immovable regulations imposed from on high. What grated was that any challenge to subsequent policies was met with a shrug, there is no alternative. They are the EU rules, given an extra moral force when associated with international agreements. It's within this context that I want to support the very sensible amendments put forward by the noble Lord Vaux of Harrodon, maybe with a different reasoning, but I thought he made an excellent explanation of his thoughts. These amendments, it seems to me, all contain the spirit of flexibility and call for us to consider, as well as environmental concerns, what the social and economic costs of meeting targets in this mill might be, to ensure they aren't disproportionate to the alleged benefits. The amendments ask us to take into consideration the possibility that not just that circumstances might change, but that evidence might mean a rethink, and that would mean a different cost-benefit analysis. And cost-benefit analyses, I think, are essential in a democracy to give both politicians and, more importantly, voters, a choice of priorities, a sense that there is always an alternative. So I want to address targets, not so much missing them or whether they should be long-term or interim, but rather the dangers of making them over-binding. It's important, I think, not least to ensure that citizens know what is being legislated for in their name, that the social and economic costs and trade-offs of environmental targets are not removed from public debate with an there is no alternative, it's binding and in the law dismissal. Make no mistake, targets in one area regularly have a cost elsewhere. For example, the net zero target is regularly bandied about as an aspiration we all agree on reaching at any cost. But when Andrew Neil asked the Chancellor Rishi Sunak on GB News last week to break down those costs, to put figure on, figures on them, that was not so comfortable and there's no transparency when there's no figures. Because what is clear is that net zero as a target will have a cost, not only for the Treasury, and we know that might mean at the expense of other spending priorities, maybe social care or job creation, but it also will land exorbitant costs on householders in terms of making their homes net zero compliant, such as the compulsory demand to replace gas boilers. I've noticed when I've raised this issue in this House, the regular replies are, we need to take the public with us. We need to educate the public so they understand why they need to change their behaviour and why we need to reach net zero. In other words, reaching the target is treated as a given, a fait accompli. And to note, this means the target usurps choice. So I just wanted to reflect a little on choice. If you say to the public, you should support this net zero target because it's necessary to save the planet from climate catastrophe, of course it's a no-brainer. However, if you say, do you support the net zero target with its trade-offs, and that could mean reducing living standards, or if you say we'll abolish every petrol and diesel car, discourage driving in general, but if you insist on driving, we'll make it an expensive electric car. And by the way, I googled yesterday and the cheapest I could find was 18,500. And the most popular UK electric uh, Tesla is an eye-watering 42,000, which, you know, for most people is quite a challenge. Or if you describe in detail the impacts on individual lives of decarbonising the economy, maybe there'd be less enthusiasm for the target once the trade-offs were known, but who knows, people have a right to know. With this Environment Bill, if we tell the public that it's about reducing fly tipping and toxic pollution, or stopping sewage from being dumped in rivers, or reducing flooding, or protecting wildlife in the country, I'm sure there will be lots of nods of approval, and from myself as well. But if you explain that legal targets throughout the bill 
could mean regulatory barriers to economic bounce back, holding back industrialisation, creating material limits to much needed house building and economic development, there might be a different response. I said in my speech at the second reading that there's always been posited, there's already been posited a tension between this bill and the planning bill or planning reforms. I fear that the result of the Chesham and Amersham by-election may fuel this with an unholy alliance of shy nimbyism and green activism. I am personally very much on the side of relaxing planning regulations, of releasing land for new building, infrastructure and housing, and yes, even some building on the green belt, not because I want to concrete over the countryside or am opposed to any protections of green spaces per se, but because the green belt is being treated as sacrosanct or untouchable, but yet is 13% of England's total land and is much larger than the 7% of developed land. So I think at least, at least it needs to be looked at again. But mainly for me, uh, the social priority is solving homelessness, tackling the problem of young people excluded from the housing ladder and the distorted and ever-growing costs for renters. But that's all just my opinion, and many people here don't support it, and it may not be a popular uh, set of opinions outside of here. However, it is precisely these sorts of arguments, weighing up the costs and benefits and the trade-offs of policies that we need to have in the public sphere. And I fear that the immovable targets in law over binding can only obscure transparency and rule debate on the implications of this Environment Bill off limits. So my final thought is that targets can too easily become the end, not the means to an end. We've seen during the last 15 months during the pandemic targets taking an almost Soviet-style command and control form. Daily reports of numbers tested, Nightingale hospitals built, even if not used. Too easily targets can be bean counting exercises, the impression of activity, but often a cover for the lack of transparency over detail. So I hope these amendments are adopted, and I hope Lord Vaux doesn't mind me backing him. I'm sure we won't agree on many things, but I thought they were very important. Because these amendments could at least remind the government to conduct cost-benefit analysis for actions associated with the legislation. And it's an important acknowledgement of the importance of social and economic challenges, as well as solving the practical problems in relation to the environment. And it's also an antidote to the ubiquitous demand here, in every amendment that I've heard, that there should be ever more binding targets, because I fear that these could undermine democratic accountability.